Members of the South-South Cross River State House of Assembly, sacked by the Federal High Court in Abuja, have appealed their removal in filing as, uh, by their counsel, in a filing by their counsel, Michael Zekome. The 20 legislators were ordered to vacate their seats for defecting from the People's Democratic Party to the All Progressive Congress. Justice Taiwo Taiwo of the Federal High Court also ordered Independent National Electoral Commission to conduct elections within 90 days. Okay, a lot to unpack this morning. They vacated their seats. Now, uh, the court has accepted, uh, there's a filing now of, as regards appeal for them. But of course, nobody's going to go without a fight, <laughs> way, like, quite clearly. But I find it interesting that the court appears to be trying to impose some kind of sanity and civility on the behavior and the excesses of politicians who just decamp mm. willy-nilly. And we've often heard it observed about Nigerian politics, that there's no ideology. Mm. Such things one would imagine would grow organically as our democracy develops. But it looks as if Nigerian courts are deciding we're going to impose ideology mm -hmm. on you. You cannot just you know, switch whatever um, way that you want. And this is a really interesting ruling. Obviously, like you said, it will be challenged. But what's really interesting about it for me is that even though there was evidence being adduced that those um, lawmakers had been expelled by the party, the court rejected that evidence. And that goes to show, it's, you know, we always talk about how, you know, the average person on the street does not trust Nigerian politicians. Mm -hmm. It appears that even our judges don't either. Even your evidence that you adduced that you were expelled from the party has zero probative value. Because what that means is that the judge realizes that it could have been manipulated. Mm -hmm. And it probably was. That's what, that's what that says to me very mm -hmm. clearly. So I do think Nigerian politicians have a long way to go in terms of their perception in the public. Mm -hmm. Because this kind of ruling will be extremely popular. Yes, it will be challenged. It might not stand. But it will be extremely popular. Mm -hmm. okay, OK, I think the development is important for our jurisprudence. What is the issue before the court? Uh, whether a man can win an election on the platform of a political party um, as a trustee of the mandate of that political party and then decide to, in the course of his uh, service, go from that political party to another political party when it is clear that he's not an independent candidate. Uh, this is not the first time that this will be considered. A reference has been made to the Abigunde case. In the course of it, reference has been made to Amechi versus Hynek. In the course of it, reference has been made to AG Federation uh, versus Atiku Abubaka uh, under the Obasanjo administration. But in recent times, the matter has come up again. First, in the case of Ebony, where the Court of Justice uh, Inyang Ekwo uh, decided that within the uh, purview of Section 221, of the Constitution, a mandate belonging to political parties and the absence of independent candidacy, and you know, governors or uh, elected persons acting only as trustees, gave the order that uh, Governor Umahi, his deputy, and 15 others in the State House of Assembly should vacate their positions. Now, that became very controversial because we had some learned uh, counsel arguing that, well, whereas uh, the court may have been right with regard to the 15 members of the House of Assembly in uh, Ebony, uh, who could not even prove that there was a dispute within their party, uh, but that it would not apply to the governor and the deputy, who probably, in their view, enjoy immunity under Section 308, who therefore cannot be uh, sued in their capacity in that office. And then they threw up also the Atiku Abubakar case, quoting the Section 40 of the Constitution that was put up uh, by uh, the court in that particular case. Okay, we were still dealing with that, and then this other matter relating to Cross River came up. Again, here, the plaintiff is the People's Democratic Party. And the plaintiff in this particular case uh, did not include the governor and the deputy, although I understand there is another case in that regard. And what has been ruled upon as at this moment by Justice Taiwo Taiwo of the Federal High Court of uh, Abuja is to say that, look, within the purview of Section 68, 1G of the Constitution and Section 109 of the same Constitution, 
those 18 lawmakers and two members of the House of Representatives to vacate, to vacate their seats immediately. It was a declaratory order. Okay, what is the argument? The argument is that they cannot claim uh, that the court has no jurisdiction. The learned uh, justice put that aside and said the court has jurisdiction in the matter. Secondly, uh, he said that uh, they cannot claim that there was a division within the party mm -hmm. because there's a clause under Section 68 that you can protect yourself by saying there was division in the, within the party. At the time, they ported, to use Nigerian English, to the other uh, political party. Mm -hmm. He claims that there was no you know, uh, division uh, within the party. And on the basis of all of this, you know, he says that they were not independent candidates. Mm -hmm. And the uh, line of justice argued, oh, bitter. That he hopes that a time will come, you know, in Nigeria, when even the electorate will insist that if we vote for you on this particular platform, you cannot carry our, our vote and go to another uh, platform. That, that, that's so bitter. It has nothing to do with the main ratio. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, he ordered that INEC should, within the next 90 days, uh, order uh, new elections. Uh, well, okay, so... That's why I say it's good for our jurisprudence, because mm. this has been a touchy point. Mm. And I guess that uh, now that the Cross River State Government has gone on appeal, they fight uh, a process for stay of execution at the Federal High Court, and they've gone further to the Court of Appeal, in the same manner in which you know, the uh, Ebony State Government responded. So this is a matter that's likely to go all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we will have you know, greater clarity with regard to the constitutional interpretation of who exactly owns the mandate. Is it the political party or the candidate? Mm. And whether or not this will lead us to a point where Nigeria can begin to think more seriously about uh, independent uh, candidacy. But the mm. other argument that people put up is the moral argument, mm. uh, which is that why will you win an election on the platform of a political party and you go to another uh, political party? But it looks like a uh, chop time has come for lawyers. Yeah, I chop, see chop. that uh, you know the legal community has become very active. You know, filing uh, stay of execution, filing appeals, going from one court to the mm -hmm. other. So ahead of 2023, you know, every election is uh, chop chop time yes. uh, for counsel. I mean, uh, and in that spirit of chop chop time, one thing has to be said: we need to tell ourselves the truth in this country. We need to be able to ensure that the judiciary clears all of this. Because we've been having this for quite a while. That discrepancy between the political party and the candidate itself. Because in the arguments for the appeal filed, those are some of the arguments put forward by the council, that it is the candidate that owns. And there were some you know, sections of the electoral laws and electoral act that they used to bolster that point, that it is the candidate, that the party it's just a platform on which the candidate uh, campaigns on. And when the vote finally comes in, it comes to the candidate. So the candidate can take the vote elsewhere. But we've had other rulings in the past that insist that it's the political party that holds sway. And we can't wait for us to clarify this once and for all. Because if you check other climbs in the world, a politician is a Democrat for almost all his life, or a Republican for almost all his life. But ask a Nigerian politician, what's your political party? On a yearly basis, this one is APC, PDP, APC, PDP. You don't even know the political party again. Tundu, we once had a guest here, <laughs> a politician here, that they booked him to come and speak for APC. As he got there, we heard that he has defected <laughs> and moved to another party. So we're confused. We need which to is, go. Which is just a style tower's point. <laughs> that the political party is a vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. If you enter a particular vehicle to get to a particular destination, you don't carry that vehicle and carry it to another. And you can't say just a platform. The platform is everything. It's the everything. structure is everything. So, and he did say, he made it very moral. You can't continue to sin and expect grace to abound. That's actually what the judge said. Yes. And it's true. That's all on Newsday Live. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll have Michael Wilson to give us updates on global business activities stay across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Morning Show here on the Rise News. We're now being joined by Michael Wilson for Global Business Update. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, let's have a look at Asia Pacific, first of all, and you won't be surprised that uh, what's happening there is a fairly uh, mixed session, actually. Uh, China Eastern Airlines, after the China 
crash, the China airline crash uh, yesterday, uh, down about 5.82%. Um, Hong Kong shares actually um, doing reasonably well. Alibaba surging, um, news about um, their share organizations there. Hong Kong slightly broader. Um, Chinese companies, I picked one out here. This is DJI, the drone maker. Chinese companies like this one being used on both sides of the war. Uh, and what China, what China's companies, they're one, one among many who are actually deciding you know whether it's going to be commerce or whether it's going to be politics and so on which rules the day it's a very very difficult balancing act uh, for them as far as the united states is concerned um jay powell really distinguished himself yesterday talking yesterday uh, evening u.s time um very very hawkish uh, indeed although um, it has to be said that the full effects of the war have not been felt yet as far as commodity prices are concerned or uh, people haven't quite taken on board that fitch has downgraded its global forecast by about 0.7 percent to three and a half percent um so stock futures um relatively slightly higher but not nothing nothing enormous again people thinking about what jay powell said and wondering what at what rate and how by how much these interest rate rises in the united states are going to be uh, nike shares doing quite well at yesterday uh, the dow jones um fell 201 points yesterday completely unsurprised by that all very very uh, all very very volatile um, the boeing crash uh, that uh, you know despite the human tragedy of it nevertheless it's affected uh, the company it's the 737 max again and there are complete worries about that and and also um Boeing itself and maybe even the company's survival as a result of it. Um, according to Joe Biden, the United States is warning that uh, Russia is preparing cyber attacks on, uh, on, on countries. And he's been very, very strong about this. One US official was saying that the government has seen preparatory activity. She didn't name which particular industries they were, they were aimed at. But the White House has been saying, look, we've issued advice about this. It's time that you started to make sure that you're actually doing that, you know, to the simple stuff of changing passwords all down to the normal cyber security that's actually involved um, to the eu and we're seeing a big in, big uptick in inflation particularly in germany producer prices up by a record 25 percent last month uh in germany uh and the, the february figures are indicating that inflationary pressures are still rising in germany we can expect a lot more of that uh the eu uh, staying with the eu the spanish prime minister pedro uh, Pedro Sanchez has said that uh, it would be silly to uh, not review energy policy right now. There's a summit at the end of the week. We must not, he says, become hostage to uh, to Russian energy demands. Rishi Sunak, he's got his spring. He's the the uh, finance minister in the UK. There he is. He's got his spring statement tomorrow. Um, th will it? Will there be? Will there be tax rises reversed? What about national insurance? What about fuel duty? Um, he's he's not wanting to go down in history as being a tax rising chancellor. How he can help that, I don't know. But he's, he's a very very narrow tightrope. That takes us on to P and O, and still the fallout here. And various people are warning there's going to be pol big political, maybe even consumer uh, fallout from what's happened here. And certainly, it's done British business no good, and most importantly, perhaps done Dubai business no good either Dubai wanting to be the New York of the desert as it puts it um, and uh, it, it's actually th this th this kind of conduct whether whether it be legally right or wrong um, it seems to be wrong to most people um, the uh, and Britain is preparing to temporarily nationalize um, the Gazprom retail unit in the UK this is nothing to well it is it's part of the Gazprom Empire but in terms of it it's also a supplier to UK and they're thinking about maybe um, nationalizing that um, oil crude prices I've seen some extraordinary stuff overnight Brent at 119 WTI 115 it's probably falling back from there I mean it, it's a very very volatile market to be involved with and China's decision also to avoid broad-based lockdowns has added um, a big push to the price of, of oil in terms of demand and gold finally um, well it's 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 difficult to actually trade in these safe haven products because as soon as you do it it can uh, people can walk out of it again um, it's basically trading sideways the sort of range I'm looking at is between um, about 19 uh, 1910 and 1950 an ounce but that could change 
change. And so it's silly placing any forecasts on it right now. That's the global view. All right, Michael, why is Rishi Sunak deceiving himself? He's been that chancellor of the exchequer that has inflicted more pain or the most pain on the British people in recent time. In fact, it wasn't as terrible under the time of Norman Lamont, you know, when there was high inflation in England and Black Wednesday happened. It wasn't this terrible. It is astronomical, the cost of living. Two questions. Number one will be, uh, Jay Powell is saying, I'm going to tighten things. I'm going to tighten monetary policy. What's going to be the effect of that? What's going to be the ripple effect around the world? And secondly, when will the world, uh, just not Europe, when will the world determine its energy mix? A couple of months ago, Alok Sharma and some other people at COP decided that the world was going to go clean by 2060, 2070, decided to set targets for themselves. But it's obvious that we can't meet those targets because we've not settled our energy mix. In Britain, for instance, they still talk about nuclear, the Hinkley power plants that British government doesn't have money for. So when are we going to make those decisions about our energy mix? Uh, well, I'd, I'd throw that right back at you and, and talk about, you know, what oil producing companies are actually doing about that, whether they're going to diversify or not. Yes, you're right about nuclear. Very expensive, 20 billion pounds per plant. Maybe they'll be looking at smaller ones. There are discussions taking place uh, right now. Yes, I think all these green targets were fine when we were in that kind of world. Now we're in a different world. Uh, and, and energy, energy is energy, the energy where we take energy from um, is being uh, is, is being discussed and is being shifted very very rapidly indeed so i think that maybe some of those green targets may have to wait maybe they won't maybe 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 this is one of these fundamental changes that causes scientists and technicians to change the way in which they think about energy all these targets are perfectly possible it's a question of the political will behind it maybe let's hope we're looking at what we're seeing right now as a blip in inflation and a blip in energy supply i suspect not but i think that people that technologies will change to adopt it because that's what tends to happen. It often takes a shock like this to make things happen. So I wouldn't have thought uh, any kind of targets are either on or off right now as we speak. As far as the United States is concerned, um, yeah, I think that what's going to happen is that um, developing countries are going to find it harder to, to service their debt simply because the dollar will rise as a result of more hawkishness from the United States. Again, it's only a mood. We don't know how much it's going to be and we don't know when it's going to happen. But if you tie in the asset reducing uh, program, the pandemic asset reducing program that the United States is involved in, as are all m major central banks around the world, then things are going to get tighter. And when things get tighter, people look to um, currencies and, and the, do the dollar will appreciate whatever damage that does. Yes, I think it'll be I think it'll be quite significant. We're in big changing times. Right. Well, I, no, may I? <laughs> OK, thank you. I wanted to talk about the P&O ferry story again and how it's emerged that seafarers are being paid £1.18p an hour, which is way, way below the minimum wage in the UK, which is at least £9.18p, depending on the age. And if you're an apprentice, £4.18p. So it's completely, I don't want to use a really harsh word, but let me just leave that there. What exactly is the Minister of Transport, um, Grant Shapps, going to do beyond condemning this rather underhand practice that I found a polite word to use. He's, he's condemned it, but then what happens beyond condemnation? <clears throat> Yeah, if you go to modern ports, you'll find out that you see you see a um, quite a collection of flags flying from the stern of, of boats or from their masts, uh, and, and these are often called flags of convenience, aren't they? So, in other words, many many ships are registered in places which do not have the same kind of a tax and same kind of standards, maybe that are that are demanded on, on, in more organised ports, as British and, and US ones, and may, maybe N Nigerian ones too. Um, so, I think that 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 that's going to be a problem. What Grant Shapps is actually doing is, is, is uh, well, I mean, you know, he is a politician, uh, but he, he's seizing opportunity. I don't think they can do an enormous amount because DP Ports, which is the, which is the owner of these, these ferries, has actually invested so much in the UK. But what he's pointing to is there certainly will be a political backlash. Maybe there'll be a consumer backlash too. Maybe people will say, I will not travel on a P&O ferry because of what's happening to the staff itself. Um, Adding to this, I mean, the, the really serious thing, uh, of course, all, all, the, all these losses of jobs 
are very serious. But in terms of commercial activity, Lloyds of London are now saying that they're not necessarily sure that the insurance premiums that they hold on these ships will actually be valid with inexperienced crews. How do you train a crew to sail across some of the most congested waters in the world who do not necessarily, and remember this, do not necessarily speak the same language as each other, never mind the instructions that are painted on a ship that's been made in China, for example, in the engine room. It's all this, isn't it? You know, how do you actually deal with that sort of detail overnight? You can't do that. This is, this is what the big problem is. I, I'm not, I, I don't know what politicians are going to do. I can tell you that having spoken to people who sail in foreign registered ships, it's a, it's a problem because if the crews don't speak the same kind of language, what happens in an emergency? So you can see there is a commercial worry about this as well. I suspect that commercial worry will actually rule the day at the end of it. There's a, a lot more fallout to come. Okay, maybe I, I, we should just dwell a little bit more on what Jay Power said yesterday at the uh, National Association uh, for Business uh, uh, Economics uh, you know, event. Now, it sounded different about a week earlier uh, when at that time, uh, it looked like uh, the Fed was uh, very optimistic and its expectations of, about inflation was rather low. Now, J, the same Jay Power is now saying, look, it needs to deal with stability. Uh, the economy is getting too tight. Uh, America needs to deal with its balance sheet of about uh, $9 trillion. But the fear in the market, which responded almost immediately, you know, because there was a sharp drop in the stock market, is that, look, a recession is inevitable. So two things. Is a recession inevitable? And two, is J Power responding to pressures about people who concluded that after, you know, the uh, conclusion last week, that the Fed is a bit too optimistic? I can't speak for him because I don't know what his political background and what political pressures um, are being placed on him. I suspect there will be probably many. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the recession is one thing. I'm more worried about stagflation, actually, which is rising interest rates when growth is relatively slow, because that's a self-fulfilling bad downward spiral. And I think that's what the United States has got to avoid. I suspect it will, because in the past, um, the Fed has done quite well. It's very difficult to look forward. But those are the pressures, certainly. Uh, I, uh, why, why there's been this it's not quite a U-turn, but it's certainly a noticeable increase in hawkishness from him um, remains remains with him. I simply don't know the answer to that. All I can do is that the likes of you and me looking at this, it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that inflationary pressures are going to rise because Americans still want to drive, they still want to eat, they still want the grain, they still want the hamburgers and beef gets fed on grain and da 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 and all that sort of thing. It, it, just, it just goes down the line. These supply chains and these inflationary pressures are there. We, we know they are. Um, I, I don't see what the great surprise is, but the markets, the markets looked at this. What the markets actually like, I, 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 I'd be I, I'm not exactly sure about this. I think what the markets actually like, history tells us that they like stability, provided they know which way they're going then people can actually adapt to those and they can alter their stock um, selection from those which thrive when interest rates are high to those which don't and so on and te tech stocks to make their own judgments about that provided they know roughly what the thought is and i think when there's a sudden turn like this even though it's not a u-turn but it's a it's an indication that there's a lot of hawkishness there i think the markets quite justifiably will worry and, and so would i and presumably so would you well, thank you very much, uh, Michael Wilson. Thank you very much indeed.